much to be thankful for, we serve a mighty God. Yes. And, and you know, when you think about what you're going to say, uh, I remember a preacher telling me years ago, just preach what's big in your heart, you know? Woo. And what's big in your heart is just how much God loves us and how much we need to look toward him. And one of the things, um, verses that it's always been a touch to me was Zephaniah 317. And, and this is, I have different translations and, and, and they all have their value because they bring out a little bit more. But the World English Bible, one thing it says, Yahweh, your God, is in the midst of you. A mighty one who will save, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will calm you in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Yes. I think that's just so powerful. Yes. And to amplify, the Lord your God is in the midst of you. A mighty one, a savior who saves, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in silent satisfaction and in his love he will be silent and make no mention of past sins or even recall them. Yes. He will exalt over you with singing. And we look at exalt means uh, one of the synonyms rejoice, show or feel elation or jubilation, especially result of success. You know, when, when you tell people God loves them, sometimes that's hard for them to understand. Right. God loves you. And I always got a picture. He rejoices over you singing. I got a picture. of we, We've had um, kids in our family and, and newborns and and I, I just remember, you know, you just kind of holding that newborn in your arms and singing. Oh, that's how I get a picture of what God does. That's how much he loves us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, just, I just get so excited to see that, that God cares for us so much. And I feel our only responsibility as a human being that has accepted Jesus Christ is to worship him. Yes. It's to lift him up. Yeah. In Psalms 121, it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Uh, can you imagine? God wants us to look up. I will lift my eyes to the hills, and I got the amplified version around Jerusalem, the sacred Mount Zion, and Mount Moriah. From whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord. That's where it comes from. Who made heaven and earth? He will not allow, not allow your foot to slip or be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Yeah. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's just think about that for a minute. I just to imagine, you got a Lord, he's not going to slumber, not going to sleep. You can call him up 24 hours a day. Yeah. Seven days a week, yeah. you can call upon him. Because some people, you know, you ask him, you know, hey, brother, if I have a need, can I call? Oh, sure. But it depends. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. It's, it's got to be before 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> And after after six or seven in the morning, I, I said that to a, one of my cousins one time, and he called me up at three in the morning. Yeah. Well, Tim, you said call me, call you anytime. I said, what do you call three in the morning? What do you need? I just want to call, say hi. <laughs> I said, well, I think you could probably call, and say hi after seven o'clock. You know, but but Lord, we we you know the thing that I love about the Lord is that you don't interrupt His life. You, you know, when, when the pastor was talking about, you know, when you, when you have uh, a Jesus in the midst of the storm, and Jesus was sleeping, yep. okay, and, and the storm was raging. Now, somebody, you know, because Peter was kind of more the spokesman, said, you know, we need to go wake him up. Because we're, we're dying here. We need yeah. to wake him up. Yeah. Now, you can imagine Jesus in this deep sleep. Yeah. Can you imagine how they woke him up? They didn't just go over and tap him on the shoulder. I mean, I tell you what, their boat's getting ready to go down. So you can imagine, like, hey, wake up, wake up. We, we need some help. You know, but you know what? There's no mention that Jesus got irritated. Well, he just said, you guys have a little faith. Don't you understand who you have on the boat? I made the water. I made the sea. You know, and that's what we got to look at. You know, he didn't get mad at them guys. He said, where's your faith? That's the only thing I have. Where's your faith? And I think that's where Jesus, with, with us as human beings, looks at us and says, you know, I come down here on earth, and Jesus was every bit of God, every bit of man, so he understands. Right. He understands what you, he, he, he's been a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. You know, Mary had to put diapers on him, and we don't like to think of God like that, but he had to learn to walk. That's right. yeah. You know, he had to learn to do all that. He had to learn, you, you still got the emotions of, of a 10-year-old kid. Right. You got all, the, all those things. 
And what he could say is that, you know, hey, I understand what you've been through. I've been a man. Yeah. I understand that. I understand your frustration. To me, the saddest scripture in the whole Bible has to be, to me, is when the disciples forsook him and fled. When he come in the garden, that is so sad. Because it said all the disciples yeah. forsook him and fled. Yeah. Well, is that John the one that called him they loved him? Yeah. All of them. When we talk about fled, they're not just walking away. <laughs> Now, if you ever seen older guys run, it ain't, may, may not be a pretty sight. But let me tell you, when you're scared like that, I mean, Peter drew the sword and cut the ear off. I mean, that, there was a lot of emotion that they didn't understand everything that was going on. Yeah. But you know what? I always loved the way Jesus dealt with Peter. Mm -hmm. After he said he's going to deny me and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, you ever notice that? Mm -hmm. he he come to Peter, do you love me? You know, he didn't say, you know, really, Peter, I don't appreciate that at all, the way you treated me. Why don't you support me? Uh -huh. No, I said, you know what, Peter? I love you. That's what he wanted. He said, when he rose from the dead, you want to tell, tell all the disciples, I rose from the dead, and Peter. Don't forget, tell Peter. Because that's the way he loves us. Man, I tell you what, if, if God gave us a bonus on one mistake, we'd all be out of here. You know, I have people come and ask me. They, they know I'm a Christian. They're coming. He, he said, does, does uh, uh, God give you second chances? You know what I always tell them? Nope. Now, because if he stopped at number two, we'd still be gone. Okay? And after two, you're done. He doesn't do that. You go out, you don't do that with your kids. If they mess up the second time, I, I'm getting rid of them. I always like to, because <laughs> you don't do that, right? You love your kids. And I, I, I know we, we got time here, but I, you know, one thing that, I, that always impressed me about the prodigal son, that whole story, how did the father know which day the son was coming home? How did he know that? He didn't know which day he was going to come home. But you can tell you've been praying. You know, it's almost like he went every day, walked down that road. Yeah. Every day, Lord, bring my son home. It's like every day he went down there. And then one day he walks down and he sees this figure. Oh, man. And he runs. Again, he got this old He's running toward him. Yeah. And the son's got this message. Oh, I'm going to tell, you know, hey, our father, I sinned. And, and I shouldn't even call your son. And it's like. The, the, the father interrupts him. Oh, you're home. And hug him. I got four sons. I got to tell you this, and I'll get on, Pastor. Sorry. But I have, I have four sons and went to St. Louis uh, uh, Six Flags. Well, two of them got stranded from us, okay? So I had two. Another two didn't know where he's at, so they went to security to try to trace him down, you know? And I remember one of them, we were sitting in this area, and one of them stuck his head in. He was in a, uh, uh, one of those music and he stuck his head out. So I had number three, and I remember saying God to this, and I know it probably wasn't the best thing. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, God. That's just not good enough. I got four sons. I'm sorry. I got four sons. I need them all to come home. I love them all. And here come my oldest walking out, and it's scary, and I'm running up to him, and I'm like, what are you doing, Tim? Because I love you, that's why. That's why. I mean, I'm not going to kiss them. Because to me, all God's children need to come home. Yes. All of them. Amen. You know, that's the cry of his heart. Yes. And, and we're going to share a, a prayer request and praise tonight. Anybody like to get started? Just share what God has done for you. Roberta. Uh, so my, my mom called me yesterday. Uh, and then during our conversation, she told me that this guy, who was a family friend, uh, passed away during the night. So then she was telling me how she was feeling during the day, and she said, you know, I never thought this was going to impact me so much. So I was thinking about that during the day, and this morning, after I got up, she, took, she has taken the habit of every morning sending me uh, an inspiring message of her mm -hmm. writing along with the scripture that she finds every day. Ooh, amen. And <clears throat> after she did that, and I read it, and I was thinking some more about what she said about this guy. I sent her this message, and I said, you know, I was thinking last night about what you said about Brown. His name was Jeff Randy, is that's what we called him. And I came to the conclusion that the reason why his death affected you so much is because he was our family. Mm -hmm. He had been with us through a lot of the things we had gone through in life that had been significant for all of us as a family, and he suffered with us the same way. He will be truly missed. For he is one of us. But we rejoice in the consolation that he met with the Lord and we welcome him with open arms. Amen. Amen. That's right. so, Amen. Uh, 
people that are complete strangers in our lives that are not related to us in any way that we need just as friends and the reason why we can feel for for these people the way that we felt about this person we still do is because we have come to know and experience and understand the love of God that's right. amen 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 that's good amen that's awesome very good it's always about the love of God how much he loves us you know, you, you see those uh, pictures and stuff. He loves us this much. Yes. His arm. My mom used to do that. She used to run. She had seen. She'd run like this at you. She hadn't seen you. And I thought, how can you do that when you're wide open? You know, you're like this. But that's how much he loves you. Yeah. I I I know. Uh, Leah likes to say this a lot about love. You know, I love you to the moon and back. You know. I mean, that's how far, but we can go farther than that. We can go out in the universe, into the universe. That's how much God loves us. And he cares about us every day. Can you imagine his thoughts? He's thinking about us all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody asked him, when do you ever stop worrying about your kids? I said, how are you going to do that? <laughs> they, they all got different issues. You don't. If you're, right. if you're a mom and dad, or you, you never stop thinking about your kids, you know, and wonder how they're doing and praying for them. You never stop because that's how much you love them. Yeah. Someone else. That's right. Amen. Amen. And I said, Amen. Just keep that on your mouth all the time. And, and I said, it isn't over till it's over. And Amen. Said, God's right. got, is in control of this. And you belong to him and he wants you to have the desires in your heart. Well, Amen. this week everything kind of turned around and problems just started falling away. Wow. Amen. And they close tomorrow. Amen. Woo! There, uh, Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. They're also getting a year where they've reduced their house payment for a year Amen. to help them adjust. Amen. The realtors ended up paying for a uh, a well had to be secured because it, the copper moves to make it safe for the kids. Mm -hmm. A front door ripped off while it was still uh, in the process of uh, being sold, and they replaced the door all Amen. of their expense mm -hmm. amounts, and then her husband didn't have to pay any of that. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's what God does. You know. Instead of losing a thousand dollars earnest money, they gain fifteen hundred. They don't lose the thousand plus they get fifteen hundred more from what they would have had to pay out yeah. in closing. That's the way God works. That's so how he works. Taking the loss, you know, he, he just he you don't have any loss, and I'm gonna give you an extra fifteen hundred on top of it. You Amen. never lose a thousand, I'm gonna give you five hundred more plus a thousand. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so that's, just amazing. that's how God does. Yeah. More than enough. He's more than enough. It reminds me of uh, anybody ever seen Chariots, Chariots of Fire? Yeah. It's really about a day off. These guys get a day off. But the one guy, and I can't remember both their names, but uh, Lydell, uh, he ran because he loved to run. Right. The other guy, he was trying to prove something. He mm -hmm. was trying to prove something, something to everybody else. He had an attitude all the time. And so this day off, they're both.
on top of everything. And Allison's situation is an example of that. Mm -hmm. We can get so freaked out by what people say and by what circumstances are trying to dictate us and forget that God is our source. God is That's right. God is yes. our back. He loves us. It's, it's the scripture. You know, you, you mentioned it Sunday, but it's the scripture God gave me when we took this church. It's Allison. If you remember, he said, I That's just his nature. He's not trying to, you know, like sometimes we have to kind of put some effort into loving people when they not so right. much. It's just God. It's just mm -hmm. God's nature. He, he can't help himself. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's that's awesome because that, that's really where he's at. I mean, you know, there's there's days we, we, we go to God and we have these needs and stuff. But, you know, it, it, it's great just to go to him and thank him. Yeah. Just to spend that time and thank you, Lord, for all you've done. I, I, and, you know, I just want to spend time with you, not asking you for this, this, this. And, and I tell you what, it, it, it does make a difference. You just go to him and you appreciate where God has brought you from. That's right. You know, you, you never want to forget where you came from, you know, where, where, you, where you could have been if God hadn't stepped in. But that's God telling you, I love you. That's right. You know, and I have a purpose. You came in this life for a reason. That's and right. I have a purpose. You know, and, and we think about think about what God can do in our life, what he's already done, and we just keep praising him. And exactly right. Not speaking negative stuff. Right. You know, speaking those positive things. That's right. You know, I can do all things. That's what Paul said. I can do all things through Christ. He didn't say some things. All things. Right. And that's where we always need to be. Amen. That when we lift God up in those situations, you know, my sister always used to say, we should pray before the fact, not after the fact. Well, and, that, and that's really what happens sometimes. We get in trouble. Right. <laughs> and then we go to God. Whereas if we'd ask him first, he might not be in the trouble. Yeah. Someone, else, Man. Right. Someone else. Yes. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Yes.
we'll definitely do that. We'll Amen. definitely pray. Amen. We'll definitely pray. Amen. Anyone else? never want to stop thanking God and we thank you for sharing your testimonies and praises and just never stop never stop thanking God because he's brought us a long way and he's got a lot for us to do yet amen, amen. praise okay we'll go ahead and, and pray we all want to stand Father God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's all about you, Lord. It's all, oh, hallelujah. 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 Thank, oh, yes, Lord. These needs, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. These needs that are here in this body tonight. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you can be with our brother's friend. That, Lord, that you can touch his life that he can you be used in his friend's life. That's what it's about. Sometimes all we can do is say, wow, uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you for working out the home issue. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, uh, all they can do is look back and realize it was you. Uh, hallelujah. That everybody realized uh, it was God who moved. Uh, and that's what it's about in our lives. Uh, that people ought to see Jesus. Uh, they understand the disciples. Uh, that they talked a different way. They acted a different way. Hallelujah. That they had been with Jesus. Uh, and Father God, we ask you to meet every need in this house tonight. Father God, the ones that couldn't be here, that you would touch their lives, touch their homes. Father God, touch the ones that need a touch in their body tonight. Father God, because you are bigger than cancer. Hallelujah, you are bigger than broken bones. Hallelujah, you are bigger than every heartache. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you said in your word, you are the healer. You are the one that healeth. You are the one that can provide. Hallelujah, that you can make a way where there is no way. Hallelujah, because you said you are the way. Hallelujah, that you are the truth and the life. Father God, it's all about you. Father God, let's lift you up. You said, now, if you be lifted up, you draw all men unto you. Oh, Father God, that we, hallelujah, lift you up tonight. That people can see you. Father God, over in Nepal, all those people that lost their lives, Lord. Father God, that you would touch that country. Father God, oh, Father God, that they would see you. I know in those difficult situations where it seems so dark. But, Father God, you are still the light. You call yourself the light of the world. Hallelujah. And you see, and we've seen that light in our lives. Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you would be with the members of the congregation, that you would be with our pastor and his wife and the families, Lord, that you would touch, continue to touch our music team, continue to be with us. Lord, as the upcoming prayer, Eastgate prayer be held, Father God, that you would get moved in that situation. Father God, you are able. You are able, Lord, to move in those lives, Lord. Those people, Lord, that, that are reaching out to you, that are in difficult situations at this time. You are God that can handle difficult situations. Father God, we lift you up tonight. We praise you tonight. We call on the only true and wise God, our Savior. Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to thank you tonight. We want to praise you tonight. Let you be lifted up tonight. Let your word go forth. Let the music and praise go forth and change life. And we thank you in your wonderful holy name. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay, May 8th. It's going to be the Eastern Gate House of Prayer. And we always, uh, we have enjoyed being there. To be able to pray with God's people Hallelujah. and know that the Lord's here. Hallelujah. I mean, that's the main thing. The Lord's got to be here. And we just thank him for meeting us here. Oh, yeah. And we can pray for those concerns. May 8th at 7 p.m. Hallelujah. We'd like everybody to join us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's speak the word. Hallelujah. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these 
these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body function to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother John, come up. Take the offering and pray over it, if you would, please.
bless you tonight, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you right now for every blessing, Lord, for all that you're doing, for the way that you use us, Lord, without our even knowing it at times. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you for that everlasting love that we experience every breath we take, Lord, as a witness of your love to us and for us. We just bless you tonight, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being a part of our lives, being the focus of our lives, the source, the strength, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thanks, everybody, for your testimonies, your prayer requests, for sharing with us. Thank you, Tim. And just for anybody and everybody, whoever is uh, in that position, don't ever worry about time. Praise the Lord. If you know anything about me, I rarely think about it. Praise the Lord. I don't want you to either. When God's moving, you just let him move. Praise the Lord. And, and uh, we're, not, we're not on a time schedule. I try to be brief on Wednesday nights as far as my preaching part just because I know people have to get up. But uh, look. It's more important that we enter into the presence of the Lord than anything else. And so it takes a little while sometimes. We just take a little longer. Amen. We're, everybody's had stuff they had to deal with today. And, and that's why the opening part of the service is such an important part because it kind of sets the tone for everything. So if, we kind of, if we're trying to rush through that, then it gets everybody kind of anxious and uptight. And so just take your time. And I appreciate all of you that, that uh, do the openings here because it... Yeah. It just uh, it makes it easier for me because then I get a chance to hear the Lord through what you're saying and uh, kind of gives me a witness and a confirmation and a, and a little bit of encouragement and for what God has already laid on my heart. Praise the Lord. So y'all just keep on keeping on and and I appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Amen. I was thinking, uh, you know how they a lot of preachers talk about balance, you know, when you're dealing with grace. And most of us have heard all this, so I'll just, but I'll say it just for the sake of saying it because uh, I can. And I do this. I, I talk until I say something. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes that takes a while. Praise the Lord. But uh, there's no such thing as balance when it comes to law and grace. That's called mixture. Right. Either, you're either in grace or you're in the law, and anything else is not good because it, it, it kind of uh, negates either one. And uh, it's like I, I was thinking about my granddaughter. She thinks a balanced diet is an Oreo in each hand. <laughs> so just praise the Lord. And that's kind of the way, uh, you know, that's kind of the way some people think about, you know, our, our relationship with the Lord. It's, it's part us. And, part God and we do our thing with the law and then he does his thing with grace but it's absolutely all about him yes, amen. amen and we know that because there's lots of days when we haven't really been up to the task you know we amen. haven't done everything we felt like we should do or could do or would even want to do and yet God is still there he's still blessing us he's still providing and taking care of us so we want to live lives that uh, you know obviously uh, give glory to God you know that our are pleasing to him and that represent him. But uh, our relationship with him isn't based on that. It's based on his love and his goodness for us, period. Everything else, we just operate out of that love. It's kind of like what I was saying about uh, Eric Liddell. He's, you know, he was saying, I run for the reason, because God made it possible for me to run. And every time I run, I feel closer to God. So when we do the things that we do, we ought to do it with that kind of mindset. We're doing it because God's made it possible for us to do it, whatever it is, and we ought to feel closer to him when we do it. You know, it isn't, you know, I, I've said a lot of times, it isn't, this, it isn't as important to me. Now, I'm not saying that I wouldn't like to see the church filled. All, that just tells me that we're having an impact, that we're reaching more people. But I'm more, I'm not as interested in how many people that I'm talking to or preaching to or, or speaking to as I am the response in their lives to what I'm preaching. 
and I don't mean here, I don't mean necessarily it's the amens and the hallelujahs and the praise of the Lord, but how it impacts our lives, how it makes our lives better, how it makes us closer to God, how it makes us understand the Lord better. That's the important thing. You could have thousands of people, and everybody walks in, gets a little entertainment, hears a few scriptures, and walks out, and they're just as, yeah. as scared, as intimidated, and threatened with life and uh, the devil as they were before they came in. This, this should free us, and that's why it's important every part of the service, not just what I do by any means, but by every aspect of the service. It, it, it's all of us together, Amen. our Amen. testimonies, our, the opening words, the, the songs that we sing. Yes. All of that, it, it enhances the atmosphere for God to become bigger. And, uh, and our, you know, fear is the greatest problem in the world, and it comes from the devil. And I, I promise you, anytime you're afraid, you mark it down, the devil's behind it. I don't care what it is. If it's uh, fear of death, fear of sickness, fear of disease, fear of financial failure, fear of relationships falling apart, it's the devil. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of love, peace, joy, a sound mind. Yes. Amen. And that's one that is focused on him. So, uh, amen. We, we need to feel victorious, whether there's 10 of us here, or 10,000. Uh -huh. It's all the same to God. One or a thousand. You know, he can do as much with, with us on a Sunday when we got 30 people here as he can in a church with 3,000. If we're, if we're here hungry for God, if we're here wanting to hear what God has to say to us, and then leave with the assurance that God's going with us, that it didn't just ha something happen in a building somewhere, and now we go back out and struggle with everything on our own. This is just where we get recharge, so to speak, and get kind of reconnected because we're out there in the world with a lot of people who don't believe and they're just, they're, they're negative about everything and they're constantly challenging every, all of our beliefs and so it's good to be able to come together and, uh, and be kind of encouraged and look around and say, see, I'm not crazy. These people believe too. These people are believing for the same thing. I'm not as goofy as people think I am. I'm just a believer. And we're not in, we're we're in this world, but we're not of it. And it, you don't it don't take you very long as a Christian to realize what he was talking about when he said that. We're just not of it. it we don't fit as easily as the world uh, would like us to, and that's where a lot of the aggravation comes from. Praise the Lord. So let me just uh, quickly get on into the message tonight, and I am going to be brief, and uh, I intend to be. Praise the Lord. To be respectful of your time and so you can get home and get a good night's sleep and go to work tomorrow all happy and Christ-like. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I speaking by faith. That's a that's a prophetic word. Amen. You just heard. Hallelujah. Okay, how about let's begin at Exodus chapter 33, and we'll we'll read verses 18 through 23. Again, these are all familiar scriptures for you folks, but uh, Bears repeating sometime. I have a very simple message, but one that we just need to be reminded of a lot of times. Uh, because the enemy tries to, he's constantly trying to drag us into fear and uh, effort and, you know, uh, you're, you're not doing enough. Or, or what, what it is you're doing uh, isn't what God wants or it isn't what God likes. And uh, I, I want us to be, I want us to live for God out of what Tim was talking about tonight, out of the love of God, not out of the fear of God in, in terms of fear that God's going to get me or that God's going to do something uh, negative in my life because that's just not going to happen. Anything negative that's going on in our lives is coming as a result of the enemy and a fallen world that we live in. Amen? We don't have to be subject to that. Even though we're in the world, we're not of the world, and Jesus has overcome this world, and as long as we stay connected with him and focused on his goodness and his grace, we're going to be all right. Praise the Lord. So he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. This is the Lord speaking to Moses. And uh, I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Now, I'll just back up for just a minute. That is Jesus. 
these are metaphors, but there's a place by me. We know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. We also know that he is the rock upon which everything is built. So God is saying, I'm, I, I, I'm gonna, I want to be gracious. I want to give grace. I want to give mercy. That's my real personality. That's my real character. That's my real identity. But because of the, because of the law, because of the, the way uh, things are established at this point, God can't approach man because there is no real <laughs> cleansing of sin. Man is still defiled. And so even though he's a friend to Moses and, and wants to give grace to Moses, there's still limits to what God and Moses can have in that relationship. He, so he says, uh, uh, the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. You all remember that old song? Uh, I remember as a kid going to Sunday school, and they used to sing that uh, rock of ages cleft for me hide myself in thee. That's, that's where this comes from, or that's where the song comes from, is right here, praise the Lord. All right, so with that, let's move to uh, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Fairly lengthy here, but I may read more scripture than I do anything else here this morning, evening, praise the Lord. So here we have Jesus and the disciples, and they're going up a mountain, and a similar situation has taken place here. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here and shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now they, the disciples thought and uh, were under the impression that that meant some of them were never, were going to live to be 300 years old or something. But actually you'll see this happens within a week. What he's talking about is going to take place within six or seven days. So he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there shall be some that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus takes with them, with him, Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And the reason they were sore afraid is because they were still under the Old Testament law, and they knew that they were in the presence of God, and that wasn't a safe place to be. <laughs> because Moses had already learned millennia prior to this, and they were familiar with these teachings, that no man sees God and lives. Right. That's why he's talking because he's scared. Yeah. Anybody ever see uh, Jeremiah Johnson? Remember the scene where they ride up and the Indians are approaching and the guy that's with him, he hangs those scalps onto Jeremiah's saddle because he doesn't know who these Indians are and they may be some of their scalps. Yeah. Well, the Indian get, one of the Indians gets off and he walks up to Jeremiah and he sees those scalps and he starts talking like this, only he's speaking Indian. And he just keeps talking really loud. And he's, the, the more he talks, the louder he talks. And finally, Jeremiah turns to the guy who actually understood the, this language. And he says, why is he yelling? And he said, because he's scared. <laughs> he's seen the scalps. He's, you know, he's talking real bold. And, you know, and that's what people do sometimes. Have you ever notice some people, you get into a scary situation. And they just start talking like a magpie. They can't shut up. And you're thinking, shut up. we got stuff to deal with here, you know. And that's just the nature of some people. And that was the nature uh, of Peter. And we know Peter was a talker. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, this, Tim mentioned it. You know, he was one of these guys who just, you know, always running. Whether he had anything to say or not was irrelevant. He's just going to be talking, period. So here he is. And he's, he's talking because he's scared. He's thinking this could be it. You know, we're, we could be in trouble. For he wist not what to say because they were so afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, 
he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another, one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. So if you know and understand what the scripture is really trying to tell us, Moses was a type of Christ. Right. Elijah was a type of Christ. Every Old Testament figure was pointing to Jesus. I'm talking about the, the Israelites, David, uh, you know, you just go down through the list. They were all types of Christ, Joshua, in one way or another. They were pointing people to the Messiah. And, and they didn't quite recognize that. In fact, Jews to this day at the Passover still set a place for Elijah. Believe me, Elijah's not coming. It's Jesus that's coming back. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's Jesus that they should be setting the place for. So... This is, what, this is what this is all about. This is Jesus just explaining to them that I am has shown up here. The one that everything is pointing to. Right? So Jesus and his disciples are barely off the mountain. And here's, the, here's what he's trying to get across to us in this. In the story of Moses as well as here. And before, before they even get the chance to show uh, what's going on, before they, they even get down the mountain, Jesus gives us a glimpse into how it is that we make our way into God's presence. Now, we do it, we do it accidentally a lot of times. I mean, I've stumbled into God's presence more often than I have figured out the, you know, the right way to get there. And it's because of God's grace. But he's showing us something here about how to always know that you can have the presence. I'm talking about manifest presence. We know that we always have the presence of God. God never leaves us. He's with us all the time. But we know that there is a difference between knowing he's with me and actually experiencing that as a, as a tangible reality at any given time, right? So that's what he's, that's what he's going to do right here and now as he comes down this mountain. Mark chapter 9, let's go verses 14 through 18 now. It's not an accident that these scriptures have, a, have an order. Remember, the Bible is a continuous writing. It's, it's not, it was never written the, the way we read it today. Right. There weren't chapters. There weren't verses. It was just a continuous writing right. by each particular writer as the Holy Spirit moved on them. So, you know, we get kind of mixed up sometimes and confused a little bit by the, by the numbering of verses and chapters when this is just one so it's not by accident, then, that we have these things all coming together. There, there's a context there that sometimes we miss. We think we're moving from one subject to another subject, when in fact it's just God continuing to talk about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So there's this big argument going on here among the teachers of the law, these scribes, and a big crowd of just other people that were there, as well as the disciples. And they're having this big debate and they're trying to cast out a demon, and it's not working. Mm -hmm. There's, their evil is present in this situation, and everybody's confused because it doesn't seem to be working what they think ought to be working, right? Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and it tells us that we're not battling against an epileptic child here or somebody with a sickness or with a disease. We're not battling with... Uh, you know, uh, crooked lawyers and uh, deceitful bankers and uh, 
crazy bosses, you know what I mean, and insane neighbors, we're wrestling against flesh and blood, not flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go back to Mark now, chapter 9, and we'll read verses 19 through 29. He answered and said, O faithless generation. This is just picking up right where we left off, right? Your disciples couldn't heal him, and, and he's, this is all the stuff that's happening to him. And Jesus answers him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since the that since this came unto him, and he said of a child. And oft times he hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deep spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into, his, into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, typically, we've, we've, we've kind of uh, decided that this means that the reason they couldn't cast the demon out was because they needed more faith, greater belief, and the only way to get that was by prayer and fasting. But that's really not in the context of what's being said here. It's, it, it, it doesn't fit the entire uh, dialogue that's taken place, and I'll show you why. See, the disciples, this other group of people, and these religious leaders, out of all of these people, there's only one figure in this entire scene that's acknowledging his weakness, that's admitting that he doesn't have what it takes to handle the suffering and the evil that he's facing. And that's the boy's father. Mm -hmm. Now we look at him, and we kind of put him in the category of the disciples, no faith, and so that's why nothing's working, and, and Jesus said you just need to pray more and fast more, so you'll have more power. Praying and fasting never changes God. It never enhances God's power. It never makes him more powerful or more willing to do something for you. I mean, think about it. Isn't God more than willing to do anything and everything for us? He's already done everything. Exactly. So it's, this is about us recognizing our weakness. Mm -hmm. And in order for me, if, I, if I'm praying and fasting, I'm not necessarily praying and fasting that I have you know, great faith to make God do something. Mm -hmm. I'm praying in a way that lets God know, God, I need you. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Fasting makes me more aware of God's ability and less of a focus on my inability or my abilities. Folk, prayer and fasting, do, they do the same thing. They change the focus from me and the situation and put it on God. It, it causes me to focus on the Lord. In essence, it's saying, Lord, I've got to have your help. I'm weak. I'm not able. But I know that you're a good God. I know that you love me. I know that you can do this. Yeah. That's, the, that's the context in which Jesus says this about the prayer and fasting. Because it immediately he speaks you know, to the disciples about their lack of faith. But he immediately goes to the Father. And he says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. And the Father says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Please, help me. And he's the only one that's really being honest in this entire situation. So those, you recognize with us, through Jesus, we don't need perfect righteousness. Amen? We don't, 
of ourselves. I'm saying we don't need to have perfect faith. We don't need to have perfect anything of our own. We just need repentant helplessness. That's what the Father's got here. Amen? In order to access the presence of God, all we need is to get over ourselves and depend on Him. Praise the Lord. That's what I call repentant helplessness. Right? I'm not BSing anybody. I'm not trying to buffalo anybody. I'm not trying to fool anybody into thinking that I had this great power. Any power we got, any anointing we've got, anything we got is a result of the Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. Yeah. Amen. It's the, it's the thing that they're, they've just witnessed, this glory. The glory Moses wanted to see. The glory that the disciples experienced in a limited way. The glory that we have total access to, and the way we have access to it is by grace, yes. not by our ability. And the father of this child somehow innately understands that. He doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying theologically he's got it all figured out, but what, what he's saying here, in essence, is exactly where every one of us are. I believe, but help my unbelief. Uh -huh. I know you can do it, Lord. I'm just confused about my part in this. What do I got to do to make it happen? I mean, Jesus could have told this guy, I'm the glory of God in human form. Ask him. They just saw it. Right? Yeah. Purify your heart. Confess all your sins. Get rid of all your doubts and your double-mindedness. And once you've surrendered to me totally and can come before me with a pure heart, then you can ask me for healing. Right? But that isn't what he says. The boy's father says, I'm not faithful. I'm filled with doubts. I can't even muster the strength to meet my moral and spiritual challenges, let alone this demonic attack. Mm -hmm. But help me. That is saving faith. Yeah. When we're dealing with the lost, a lot of times we think, well, I'm not sure if they, if they believe enough, if they have enough faith. No, if, if, they, if they just believe enough to say, help me, God, that's enough. That's saving faith. That's what, that's what we all did at some point. We, did, we didn't have theology. We didn't ha have a, you know, an insight into God and, and his plan and his perfect way of doing things and his, how magnificent his love and everything. No, we just, oh, help me, Jesus. They that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? And that's exactly what's happening with this man. I don't, I don't have it together here. My, my faith is up. It's down. I, I've got doubts about what can happen and what can't happen. I, I'm double-minded about it. On the one hand, I, I know that you can. I just don't know if you will or if, if this is the right kind of situation for you to operate in. And, and I'm such a mess. But please, help me. That is saving faith. It's faith in Jesus instead of faith in ourselves or faith in our faith. Mm -hmm. look, look at uh, Romans chapter 10 and we'll read verses 3 through 11. Because really, church, it's a lot easier to get saved than people think. Uh, if it were hard, most of us wouldn't have got saved. There's people out there, though, that are convinced this is really a job. It's really a lot of work for them to get saved. There is no work for them to get saved. They just got to cry out and call on the name of the Lord. They just need the biggest, biggest uh, uh, amount of information. The greatest revelation we can give them is exactly what was expressed here tonight. God loves you so much you cannot imagine it. Yeah. Not just Christians. He so loved the world. He loves you in the middle of all your crap, in the middle of all your deceitfulness, in the, in the middle of all your duplicitousness, in, all, in the middle of all of your lying and sneaking and conniving and all of your rebellion. He loves you. Yes. Just cry out to Him. I believe and I don't believe. I think, and I think we caught a lot of people agnostics. They're just almost saved. Right? I mean, they, they just, they're just not sure. That's the way this fellow was. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, 
have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness for righteousness to everyone that believeth. There it is. Praise the Lord. As long as you're not submitting to his righteousness, the demand is still going to be on your righteousness. That leaves us in an awful fit. Because we can't do it. We don't have, it, it just told us it's not going to happen. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Are you a believer here tonight? There's, there is no rule for you outside of faith in Christ, period. The law no longer exists in our world. It exists. It still exists. And the world will be judged by that law if they don't come to Christ. But the moment a person comes to Christ, the law is done away with as far as they're concerned because Jesus has already kept it. For us then to try to establish our own righteousness based on the law is, is somebody who says Jesus wasn't enough. Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, go on. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Right? If you're, if you're under the law, you're going to live by the law. You have to. There's no other option. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from heaven. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that's why you will not be ashamed. You would be ashamed if you were under the law because you can't keep it. Right. You'd be constantly shaming yourself by failing, right? But that's what he's talking about. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation. Right. right? Nothing to be ashamed of. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the gospel in a nutshell. It's the great exchange. Yes. He is our substitution. And we get all of the benefit for what he's done because he took all of the punishment for what we could not do. Amen? So perfect righteousness is impossible for us. Right. And if you wait for that, you're never going to get into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. That's what is so, what so limits. We've, I tell you this, and this is my opinion, you can have your own, but um, I think we've had all the revivals we need. Come on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> eh? I mean, we need a harvest. Yes. We have revivals as if we've got to do a bunch of stuff to get God to come and do what God has said from the very beginning is his whole purpose and his plan, as though we're manipulating him somehow. And the fact that we think, well, God won't come uh, and, and bring revival or bring awakening or whatever you want to call it until we all get cleaned up is idiotic. But it reinforces this mindset that somehow it's our righteousness that attracts God. But it's not. It's our honesty that attracts God. When we just cry out and say, Lord, I'm a mess. Help me. He's there. We're in, you're in his presence right then. The more we dilly-dally around with our righteousness, the less manifestations we ever see of God. Come on. on Mount Sinai, God came down as a cloud. And it, it was called the Shekinah glory, right? And you remember it from the Holy of Holies, far back as the tabernacle and, and the temple. 
where the, the high priest atoned for the sins of Israel, right? right. He'd go in there and the cloud, the glory cloud, right? And, and, and here God speaks out of the cloud, and it's his raw presence, right? Look at, let's go back to Exodus uh, 33, 17. And this God speaking out of the cloud, this raw presence of God, this Shekinah glory, amen, Israel knew that was fatal. If that high priest went in there, they tied a rope around his ankle. And if he went in there, and if he hadn't completely atoned and, uh, and, and confessed and done every, and all of the ceremonial washing and everything else, if he hadn't done everything perfect, in fact, I've read commentaries uh, by uh, Jewish uh, rabbis where they said that they would keep the high priest, whoever it was that was going to perform the, on the Day of Atonement, they would keep him awake all night so that he wouldn't, for fear that he would fall asleep and have an unclean dream. That's how strict this thing was. And when he would go in to offer the blood onto the mercy seat, they would tie a rope around his ankle because if they didn't hear the bells ringing off the hem of his garment, they knew he died. They knew he wasn't perfect in the eyes of God when he went in there, and they'd have to drag the carcass out because they couldn't go in either. That's how serious this was. So they knew, these, the Jews knew, the presence of God, it's not a good place to be. It's fatal. Right. It'll kill you. Right. right? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. On down through verse 20. Okay. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Show me my glory. That's his manifest presence. That's the Shekinah, right? And I'll make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Now, Jesus and this man, this guy, he's, he's in the presence of God. It's been said here this, this evening. This is God and man. But he's fully God as well as being fully man. This God reveals the real desire of his heart. It's like the prodigal son. It's like all of the things that were mentioned here tonight. God's love for us. It, it wants to overcome even his own limitations, his own uh, restrictions. But he can't because he's, he's law-abiding. He's, he's legal. He's righteous. He's just. So he's, It's like God is figuring out a way. I'm going to love him in spite of him. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know what the traditions are. I know what the rules are. But somehow, I've got to get this across to them. And this guy, this guy without any religion, this guy without any teaching, he gets it innately. He just understands somehow that, God, I, I, I want help, but I know I don't know how to get it. I, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not faithful enough. I'm not, you know, I'm not focused enough. And Jesus heals. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's not the glory of God manifesting, I don't know what is. That's right. So the glory shows up. God manifests. His presence is there. Because wherever God is, miracles just happen. That's right. Whatever's needed is, is, is accomplished, right? So he said, I'll make my goodness pass for you. You can't see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And that, that's because under the law, under the old covenant, and listen, this is what religion does to us. It doesn't bring us closer to God. It, it exaggerates the gap between deity and humanity. I mean, if, if we're up here talking only about sins, your failures, your weaknesses, and God's perfection, we ought to be talking about the perfection of God, but we ought to lay off all of the failures that human as believers have, because instead of bringing us closer to God, it, it creates a greater distance between us and God. Yes. It, it reinforces this idea that my righteousness is going to please God, and somehow that will bring him closer and he'll do something. If I can get right enough, God will heal my body. If I can do everything just the way it's supposed to be, if I can just not 
get angry and lose my temper, if I could just not you know, do this or not do that, then God will surely bless me financially, right? I mean, all of that stuff, it may, it may not be in the forefront, but it only takes one moment yeah. outside of that focus for everything to just almost disintegrate. You know, you can hear a message like this, and, the, and we're talking about great, you can hear these over and over and over, but you know, it only takes you about 10 seconds listening to somebody start browbeating about God's judging, God's anger, God's fury to cause you to begin to fear. And it just like it shakes everything. It's like Tim said tonight, we need to always remember the old landmarks. We need to, that's why we have testimonies. We're always talking about what God has done. We do that because we know tomorrow there'll be another issue. There'll, there'll be another challenge. And it's funny, I, I, as many times as God has moved in my life and as many miracles he's done, when I get confronted with a frightening, uh, you know, uh, uh, a situation that I know I can't deal with myself, first thing that happens is you're afraid. And every doubt comes in, and not only just, just the normal kind of doubting, but they're exaggerated. You know, you just get a cough, and man, oh, it's, can it's lung cancer. No doubt about that. I mean, after all, you smoked all those years, you know, and, and you got it coming anyhow, you know, because you did, right? I mean, and, and if it's fine, well, you, you just, you, you, you're, you're not good with money. You're a dummy. You're an idiot, you know, so it's no wonder you got all these problems, and you deserve it. You ought to be bankrupt. I mean, after all. You know, you've made poor decisions. You've made rash judgments. You know, I mean, that's, it's just like all of a sudden, Where's God? Well, he's way off somewhere because this, what this does is create this attitude of the gap being widened between deity and humanity. When everything that God has done has to make us one. Yes. That's the reason for grace. So that he's, we're always connected. That we're all, No matter how weak we are, no matter how frail we may feel, no matter how much of a failure we might feel like, we can know... I can still experience his glory anytime, anywhere, because it's not based on my strength. It's not based on my goodness. It's based on my helplessness. Yes. I mean, after all, that was the reason for the law, to bring us to the end of ourselves. Exactly. It wasn't there to see that we could do it. I mean, it was there to prove to us that we couldn't do it, and that's why Jesus comes along after a couple of 3,000 years of the Jews actually trying to do it and adding stuff to it. And he comes along and says, whoa, I know you, you've read that uh, to commit adultery is a sin. But I'm telling you, if you just look at a woman and the thought comes to you, you're as guilty as if you've done it. What's he doing? He's shattering this false belief that they can keep the law. Yeah. Same way with hatred. Well, you know, it's, uh, we know it's sin. You've read it. If you kill somebody, and I'm telling you, if you just hate somebody. Now, how many of us haven't had hatred come through our heart at some point with somebody? Maybe just for a moment. How long does it take to kill somebody? Yeah. Pop, and it's over. You can regret it the rest of your life, but they're still dead. And Jesus said, if you've just hated. I've hated people in traffic I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> right? I've had drive-by hatings. <laughs> And as far as I know, it's, it's laughable, but I'm just being facetious. The truth is, yeah. in my heart, I've committed murder. Yeah. Now, I don't like to admit that. None of us do. But the truth is, we are all guilty. Everybody is guilty. And that was the point of the law to get us to understand that. Yeah. It's impossible for you to keep the law. Right. You may have some pet areas that you're good at keeping because that's not a big deal. It's not a challenge to you. But if you fail in one point, you've failed in everything. Yeah. This is the good news. Jesus is just looking for helpless repentance or repentant helplessness, if you will. Uh -huh. Just that I don't want to be this way, but I'm a mess and I, I got to have your help. That's a change of, uh, uh, of direction, a change of mind, and that's what repentance is. And that's all he's asking for. And what God is saying is right out of a few good men. If you notice, I, I've 
I've seen a lot of movies in my time. But I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a good line. And I tell you what, I can find Jesus in almost anything. And what God is saying is, you can't handle reality. You can't handle the truth. Right? But on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the cloud comes down, not only don't the disciples die, they're surrounded and embraced by the glory of God. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Worship is more than believing. Yeah. Yeah. Worship is dependence. How many times have you come to church and you were just beat? I mean, you were just defeated. And, and you, you, you didn't come in with the great exuberant faith. You just come in, God, show up, please. I can't leave here without you. Bang, he shows up. Yeah. It's not just about believing. It's about being dependent on him. When we come in and say, Lord, if you don't move, nothing's going to move. Right. We're just going to be stagnant. We're just stuck here. We're depending on you. And everything we do, we do out of a sense of dependence. Right. I don't care how long you do this. I don't care how long you... You, you, you know, you preach or you evangelize or you pastor or do any of that stuff. I don't, I don't know how anybody can ever get to the point where they just feel like I can do it. It, it just doesn't work that way. Right. It's our dependence on God. And our individual lives are the same way. Yes. The moment we think we can do it, the next thing you know, we're flailing around like fish out of water. We can't get it together. We can't figure it out. We can't get it straightened out. And we come back to the place that we needed to be at all the time. Yeah. And that's just help me, Jesus. Thank I'm double-minded. I, 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 I'm believing and I'm not believing. But just have compassion on me. Just have mercy. Help me. And bang, the presence of God is there. He was always there. He was always there. But that's saving faith. That's the kind of faith that draws God. That's what attracts his grace. By grace are you saved through faith. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard. That's not much faith, church. But it's enough. Right. Enough to call on his name mm -hmm. is enough to see a manifestation. Amen. Just to cry out in our helplessness. Amen? Amen? Is enough to receive the glory of God. Amen. To experience the presence of God. Cool. See, we can know in our head that God loves us. But sometimes we go to the mountain and we go there afraid. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, speak to the mountain. Well, we're usually climbing them trying to bore our way through it, trying to find a way around it, you know, but we go to the mountain and we go there in fear. But in the middle of that mountain, in the middle of that challenge, in the middle of that experience, if you just cry out to God, help me, Jesus, mm -hmm. I promise you, you'll hear that voice, mm -hmm. an unconditional, permanent intimate love that says this is my child listen to him or listen to her because he said with the heart man believeth and with the mouth we speak amen, amen. a lot of times it's when we're at our weakest with the greatest amount of doubt We're reaching out to him, even in that weakness, even in that doubt. And he calls that faith. Mm -hmm. And he counts that as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm telling you, he covered every base. Mm -hmm. He loves us so much. And he knows us, as Tim said, so well. He was a human. Mm -hmm. He knows how, how much of a struggle it is to live in this world. Yes. 
and be a believer. In our weakest moments, we cry out to him. And he says, that is my righteous child in whom I'm well pleased. And that gives us access to his presence by grace. It gives us access to his glory by grace. And that's the story that he tried to reveal to us in these two lessons. All you got to do is cry out. There's grace sufficient. And it declares you righteous. And your righteousness can come boldly into the presence of God and receive everything that he has. Experience his glory. That's what we do when we're praying for people. That's what we do when we're praying for ourselves and our situations and our family. That's what we're doing whenever a mountain comes against us. We speak to the mountain, but we do it by crying out to him. And God says, that's righteousness. That's my child speaking. You better listen. Amen. 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 (laughs) Hallelujah. And all of hell, ears perk up. (laughs) Amen. Those demons got to listen. That's what Jesus was showing this old man. And that's what he's saying to each and every one of us. The next time the devil tries to tell you, you don't have enough faith. You know you're doubting this. You know you're questioning this. Just say, shut up, devil. I'm talking. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. Hope to see you back here Sunday. Praise the Lord. God is good.